We're at our final sermon of the Name of Jesus uh, series, and today we're ending with a bang. It's called Every Knee Shall Bow, Every Tongue Confess. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, let's hold up our Bibles. Let's hold up those Bibles. I see the whole front row has their Bibles. If you need a Bible, we have a, oh, there's a lot of people with Bibles today. All right. My goal is for every single believer to walk into here holding their Bible. Let's read it together. This is my Bible. Both the Old and New Testament are verbally inspired of God and are the revelation of God to man. The infallible, authoritative rule of faith and conduct. Amen. Amen. Now, it's no secret, most of us understand what I mean when I say um, entitlement. We, in, in one socket, there's a real heavy entitlement, the spirit of entitlement. Actually, all over the country, there's a, there's a hard, real big presence of the spirit of entitlement. I, I want to give you a quick definition of what entitlement means to me. When you want the benefits of something without the responsibility of it. When you want to have the benefit of something, but you don't want to have the responsibility of it, of making it happen, all you want is the benefit. You're entitled when you want the benefit of freedom, but you're not willing to be responsible. You don't want the responsibility of protecting it. You're entitled when you want the benefit of, of liberty, but you aren't willing to, to do anything with your freedom. You try to prevent others from exercising theirs. You're entitled when you, uh, when you want to access resources that you didn't do anything to earn. And you get mad if your check is one day late. Where's my check? Entitlement is in the air we breathe. Entitlement is in the air we breathe. It's everywhere. Some of y'all get mad when you come to church and you can't get the Wi-Fi password. <laughs> Entitled, you just feel like everything should be yours, right? Uh, some of us get mad when we're stealing our neighbor's Wi-Fi and their Wi-Fi is slow. You almost want to go, "Hey, everything on? Everything okay with your with your Wi-Fi?" I'm trying to check the status of the video. My cat was walking on two legs like a human, and I want to see how many people liked it. You know. <laughs> when it comes down to it. The only thing we're entitled to is the air that we breathe. And even that, the Bible says, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Some folk even feel entitled to the presence of God. But even that is something that someone else paid the price so that you could have. You didn't earn the right to come into the presence of God that was given to us. My, my main text for today is, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Open up that beautiful Bible of yours. Open it to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. We're going to read it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We say, I believe. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of those in heaven, and those on the earth, and those under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen, somebody. That freedom that you have to be in the presence of God, that freedom that we receive now in the church, that th this, is, this is given to you by the sacrifice that Jesus won on Calvary's cross. John chapter 8, verse 36, whom the Son sets free. Amen. Sacrifice is the purchase price of freedom. Amen. Amen. There is no such thing as freedom without sacrifice. Amen. And, and, and you may not have to have sacrificed it, but somebody paid so that you, somebody gave their life. World War I, World War II, and all these other efforts that, 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 that are happening right now to keep America free. Maybe you didn't pay a price, but some people paid the ultimate price. Some folks came 
wounded and mangled. Amen. But there is no such thing as free freedom. Somebody's paying a price. Somebody's sacrificing. And that idea goes all the way back to the garden. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, God responded by killing two innocent animals and taking their hides and covering the nakedness and the sin of Adam and Eve. Those two animals paid the price so that Adam and Eve could have their sins covered and forgiven. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22, verse 22 says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with the blood. And without, shed, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. Freedom comes with a price. In Exodus 12, from 3 to 7, we hear the story about when the people of God were about to get released by uh, the, the evil Pharaoh that had them in slavery for over 400 years. And then just before they were released, <coughs> um, they were told, we need you to, every family, to go get a, 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 a lamb, a, a goat or a lamb, and, and I want you to make a sacrifice, and then I want you to, they were supposed to eat together as a family and take the blood of that animal and smear it on the doorway the main entrance of every door, so that when the angel of death were to come, that was going to be the last plague that was sent to, to, to Egypt, that, that angel would skip, it would pass over. Now when you hear the word Passover, that's what it's about. The angel of death passed over every house that had that mark of that blood. Why? Because for there must be a price. Somebody's going to have to spill blood so that there can be freedom. Amen. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 15, verse 15, we find out that those same people, when they're in the wilderness and they wanted to get closer to God and they want to have a, a relationship with God, they want to come into the presence of God, they all knew that they had to take the animal and take an animal and sacrifice it so that they could be allowed into the presence of Almighty God. Amen, somebody. Amen. The, they, they were not entitled, they were not free to go into the presence of God and do whatever they wanted and live the way, however they wanted. No, because of their sin, something had to pay the price. It meant somebody. They were not entitled. They were not able to just walk into the presence of God. Now, you and I, when, 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 when before Jesus comes, we were outside of the arrangement that God had with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. In Ephesians chapter 2, 12, we find out that, that at this time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's the way we used to live. Before Jesus Christ came in, we had no hope and were, we were without God. There was no one that paid for our sins. And because Gentiles didn't understand the rules, we lived our lives and we did not repent. And so all of those that didn't pay animal sacrifices didn't serve God in their lives. They weren't able to have a relationship with God. But when Jesus Christ, he comes, he becomes our hope. The Bible said we were without hope. Jesus becomes our hope. Amen. He came to be the Lamb of God, slain from the foundations of the earth. And John the Baptist saw it. John the Baptist saw him coming. In John chapter 1, verse 29, what does John the Baptist say when he sees Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. John understood what was happening when he saw Jesus coming. He understood that the, the, the great thing that was about to happen after Jesus, there would have to be no more animals dying innocently. He would be the one and the only true sacrifice for all of our sins, for all of our penalties, for all of our bad conduct. Amen. Jesus went to Calvary. And it became our sacrifice. Some folks wonder, well, why did he have to die? Well, that's why he had to die. Why did he have to spill all that blood? Well, that's why he had to spill all that blood. 1 Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ suffered once for our sin. He did it once. He doesn't get back on the tree every time you sin. He did it once for all of our sins. 
So because of his shed blood, once and for all, now we can go where we could not go. <laughs> now we can receive what we were not allowed to receive. And now we can have what we were never allowed to have. We have a, a relationship, a personal relationship with God brought to you by the Lamb of God. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, we see a little bit more. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Watch this. Whom being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking, form, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death in the cross. Now, now when you wonder what happened here, we're starting to find out Jesus is one with God. It is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They exist in a perfect union called the Trinity. Amen. And they are all equal parts of God. But when there was a, a need for someone to come save us, Jesus said, I will, I will happily take a lower position under God. I'm, not, I'm willing to go down to the earth. I'm willing to die on the cross because, I, I, because they saw. And after a while, just so that you know, after a while, the sacrifices became so ordinary, so routine, that God stopped accepting the, act, the sacrifices. The, the animal sacrifice didn't move God anymore. Because it just became so routine that people didn't have any remorse for their sins. They knew that all they had to do was sacrifice a lamb or take a dove. Amen? And, and, and so, so God stops accepting those sacrifices. And when that happens, something else needs to happen and Jesus comes. And, and if you're wondering why we say that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, because he's the one that paid the price. What gives him the right to be that elevated, that glorified? What gives Jesus the name that is above all names? I'll tell you what it is. When God saw what Jesus was willing to do, to save mankind, he gave him the name that was above all names. And at the name, and at that name, all of the earth, all of the earth, all of the earth, they're going to bow down. When we talk about all of the earth, every human being that was, that is, or ever will be, all of us, without exception, are going to bow the knee. To the name of Jesus Christ, I promise you. The Word of God also says that even under the earth, every single foul spirit, principality, every single demon, everything that hides in the shadows and in the darkness, everything will bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And even in heaven, every single angel, cherub, every single heavenly host created, everyone but God is going to have to bow the knee to the name of Jesus Christ. Meaning every creature in heaven, earth, and underground must bow down to the name of Jesus Christ. His sacrifice bought our freedom. His sacrifice gave him authority. His sacrifice made his name greater than all the names that have ever been. But today, I ask a question to the church. How is the church reacting to the one who gave us our freedom? Do we respond appropriately to the matchless and wonderful name of Jesus Christ? I'm asking you this morning. In Acts chapter 16, 31, the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. You and who? You and who? Somebody that has a, a family member that's now serving the Lord ought to shout hallelujah right there. You and your household. Amen. Amen. One of the weaknesses of the modern church that I see is that we stop believing this power. We stop believing in this power. We stop believing, having faith for this kind of amazing glory. We stop believing and we started enduring. We, we don't hold out for better. We settle for the way things are. As if you forgot 
that all things are possible for those who believe in God. Amen, somebody. We stop believing that we could have a better government. Some people say, oh, it's... No, we stop believing that we could have better representation from the local level all the way up to the White House. We settle for what we got. We stop believing for better schools. We just send the kids to whatever school there is. Well, pastor, what choice do I have? Listen to me. You have a choice to believe. You have a choice of believing and believing that all things are possible for those who believe in God. We stop believing that things can get better. We stop believing. Many of us stop believing in the power of the gospel to change the world. What are we doing here today? Are we just trying to make sure that, that we get to heaven? Or does somebody in this room believe that there is power in this gospel that we preach to change the world? I believe it. I believe that there's power in the gospel that can change the world. But some people have stopped believing that God can improve things in our home. That God can change things in every situation. God can help you in your mental state. Amen. God can do it if you start to believe in his power. I've been telling you for a month that you've got to appropriate yourself with the power that's in the name of Jesus. Amen. We just want to live long enough, some of us, we just want to live long enough for Jesus to come back. I'm going to survive. I'm going to, I'm going to survive until he comes back. The most irresponsible thing that you can do as a believer is stop believing. Stop hoping. And just endure. Oh, this is my lot in life. This is, this, I guess this is what I'm destined for. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Amen. I really believe that God cares so much about you. I believe that God's had, God, God has a specific plan for your life. Even in this current thing that you're in, whatever it is, it does not lead to death, but to the glory of the Father. Somebody shout this, all things are possible. All things are possible. Yeah, all things are possible because we serve a God, and we serve Jesus, and every knee will bow. He's, he, he said, every knee shall bow before me. Yeah. He's not saying that, that some human beings will be exalted above others. He's not talking about the church. Everybody, every knee is going to bow before the church. No, he's saying that the entire human race is going to bow before him. Women and men, young and old, black, white, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, independent, Muslim, atheist, Jew. Movers and shakers, Hollywood, computer geeks, athletes, everybody, everybody. You name it, they're going to bow before the name that is above all names. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. None of us are going to be looking smugly over, to, over at this, our neighbor who rejected faith. No, 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 no. None of us are going to be saying, I told you. I mean, that ain't what we're going to be doing. Want well, to know what we're going to be doing when that happens? We're going to be on our face. We're going to be on our face worshiping the God that we've been worshiping as long as we've been coming to church. Nobody's going to look around to see. Listen, you're going to forget about everybody else around you because when he shows up, nobody else exists. His glory is all-consuming. His presence demands total attention. We know that in Romans 1 that God has placed some knowledge of himself in every heart. Somebody hear me. Somebody hear me. Every single human being that's been born, God put knowledge of himself in every heart. That's why you can go to the wildest and farthest places of the earth, the most remote place that's never heard of God or Jesus or anything. And somewhere in the village, there's an idol. There's something. They're, 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 they're praising something, either the sun, the moon, the stars, the oceans, the mountains. They're going to worship something, the earth, whatever it is. But there's something in every one of us that wants to worship God, even when we don't know who he is. God's eternal power and his divine nature can be seen clearly in all the things that he has made. Somewhere in our hearts, in somewhere in the hearts of the people that you want to see saved, somewhere in the hearts of your family members that are not coming to church, somewhere in their hearts, they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is real. They know it. 
They push it away. They resist it. But in that day, there'll be no resisting. There'll be no denying. We suppress the truth that he has revealed about himself. But on that day, there's no suppressing the truth. Man. Father, while it is true that every knee shall bow, my dear friends, not every knee is going to bow the same. Mm -hmm. There's some stiff knees in society. There's some people that just refuse to bend the knee. They, they'd rather fall flat than bend their knees. I want to talk about a few of them today before I finish up. And I'm almost done, by the way. There's some stiff knees that will not bow now, but they're going to bow then. The first knee is the stiff knee of materialism. Mark chapter 10, 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why did Jesus say that? Because money is a, a power that grabs the human heart and, and usurps the place of God. Some of us have money in the place of God. The disciples were amazed when this, when this rich man came to Jesus and he told him all that he said. The disciples were amazed at what Jesus said. And, and the disciples said something like, like well, who can be saved? If this, if this millionaire who has everything can't be saved, what chance do we have? Right? Because you, you figure someone that has it all, they don't have to worry about bills. They don't have to worry about, about, about debt collectors. They don't have to worry. Their life is easy. They started to wonder. And, then, and that's where Jesus comes back and he says to them, with, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. That's, chapter, that's Mark chapter 10, 27. Even though material, materialism is a stiff knee that resists bowing to God, on that day, the very richest and the very poorest are going to have to bow their knee. They're going to realize that money was not the answer. You look at, you, listen, if you have a chance to talk to somebody who's got a lot of money, I mean a lot of money, you're going to find out that after they buy all the things that they can buy, and after they spend all that they can spend and, and help people that they want to help, at the end of the day, they're going to tell you that money will not fill the void. They won't, it won't fill the void. At the end of the day, you still need God. Then there's the stiff knee of individualism. Postmodernism puts self in the place of God. So, so, so the material person puts money in the place of God. Postmodernism puts self in the place of God. Truth is no longer defined by what God says, but what I say. What well, I believe, shut up. What's the Bible say? Right? We don't talk about what I believe, we talk about what the Bible says. Amen? That, that, that's when you know you're talking to someone who's walking the path of God. We're not talking opinions here. We don't go by what we think. We go by what the Word of God says. Amen. And so there's a bunch of people that have put plate self in the place of God. So there is no such thing as truth from God that applies to people anymore. Only truth that I see. Only truth. Well, you know what? That's not true for me. Well, I just don't think God's going to send people to hell. He's too good. You are wrong. Oh, you're so wrong. Morality is no longer what is right or wrong. And it's not defined by God. It's defined by how I feel. It's defined by however we want. And so, and so right now there's this huge move, not just in this country, but all over the world, to redefine what is right and what is wrong. They're trying to redefine what is appropriate and what's not appropriate, what's sinful and what's not sinful. They're, they're saying we know better than God what is sinful. You know, the Bible doesn't apply to us anymore. We've evolved. It's 2019. Are we still going to live our lives according to a 2,000-year-old book? Let me tell you about that book. That book is alive. It is alive. That book, every word in it is still breathing. It's the breath of God. And it doesn't go out of style. <laughs> so we got this individualism. It's a stiff knee. Doesn't want to bow before God. Let me tell you, it's going to bow. And then there's a stiff knee of atheism. Stiff knee of atheism. 
So if materialists put money in the place of God and individualists put themselves in, 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 in the place of God, atheists say that there is no God. Mm. El hombre necio en su corazón dice que no hay Dios. The foolish man says in his heart, there is no God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Atheism is a stiff knee, but, but here in, in the scripture we read that God says, to me, every knee will bow. Huh. But again, we're not all going to bow the same way. Some are going to bow as defeated rebels. And others are going to bow as willing servants. Let me tell you, it's better to bow as a willing servant than a rebel that's been conquered. Amen, somebody. <laughs> Nothing could be worse for a person than to bow a knee to God as a defeated rebel. To be locked in a rebellion that you choose for whatever reason to go against God. To just, to just fight against God, to, to, to just stand in defiance against God your whole life. Boy, when you, when you bend the knee, it's going to be like your knees are being broken. Because you won't want to. You'll, you'll continue to try to deny it, but there will be no denying. When Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, the Bible says, the world will see him. I always wondered how that would be, how that the world would see him. But now with technology, it makes sense. It makes sense that, that the world will see him. Because you'd think if he shows up in one place of the world, how can the rest? Now I, now I understand why technology is working for God's purpose. Every single person is going to see him when he comes. And everyone's going to have to bow. Let me tell you something. There, the, very, the truth of hell is very serious and it's very true. And I was reading in my studying this week that there's a, there's a couple of theologians that are saying what hell is going to be like. And, 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 and in specific, where it relates to this, this, this idea that every knee shall bow, uh, they're talking about hell. And, and, and I read something that said some people think that hell is going to be this wild place where people are suffering and cursing God. But, but God won't allow that. God won't allow that. Uh, uh, you remember when we were kids, we'd we make somebody say, Uncle. You grab, put their, put their hand behind their head and push it all the way up. You say, say uncle. No, I'm not going to say it. Just say uncle. No, I'm not going to say it. Oh, uncle, uncle. And you, and you give in. You give up and you say uncle. Sometimes, sometimes your big brother, I have, I have five big brothers. And, and they'd all beat up on me a little bit. But I got bigger than them when I was 12. When I was little, they would, they would, they, one of them would take me, and I'm not going to say who it was, Stephen. He, he would take me and he put me in a tough position, and he says, you're going to do this for me. And I said, no, I'm not. You're going to do it for me. No, I'm not. And then he'd say, you're, I'm, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then when he let me go, I go, I do nothing. Huh? I'm going to do jack. Then he'd get me again. You're going to do it? No. You're gonna do it. Okay, okay, okay. And then I, until he made me, until he put me in a place where I couldn't resist his will. That's what hell's going to be like. The suffering is going to bend you to the place. Not where you curse God. Here's the ironic thing. People are going to spend eternity in hell confessing Jesus is Lord. The suffering will be such that it will bring you to that point of pain where the only thing you can do is admit, my God, I was a fool. My whole life I had a chance to accept him and I didn't. But now I know and it's too late. But for eternity, they will cry. Hmm. Jesus is Lord, my God. Now, the rest of us, in heaven, we're going to be saying the same thing, but we won't be in pain. See, there's two ways to bow. You can bow in rebellion, or you can bow as a willing servant. Now, some of y'all think that I get crazy, and I sing and I shout here. Some of y'all think that I'm a little bit extra when the presence of God falls upon me. That's all right, you can think that I'm extra, but you have not seen anything yet. Wait till you see me in the presence of God. Wait till you see me when he calls me home. Wait till you see how crazy I go when he says to me, 
enter my good and faithful servant. In the little bit you are faithful, I'm going to reward you with my everlasting presence. Wait till you see how crazy I'll go then. I'm going to lose my mind in the presence of God. Because some of us will have to bow because we realize we made a mistake. But some of us are going to realize I made the right decision by serving God. I made the right decision by not going out to club and not going out to have sex and do all the things of the world. I made the right decision for holding myself and being pure and living right before God. It was worth it all. Y'all going to go, But the funny thing is, I'm not going to be the only one. When, when it happens, guys, use your faith. Go with me. When it happens, when the trumpet sounds and, and we're lifted, when we're lifted, we're, we're lifted into glory. You're telling me you're just going to sit there the way you did during worship today? When your eyes behold Jesus, you're telling me you're just going to chill? You ain't. Let me tell you, you ain't. You're going to break your neck worshiping God. I mean, you're going to go crazy. You're going to go out your mind. If you're lucky enough, if you're blessed enough to be the few that is counted, because there ain't a lot of them going. If you are counted as one, hmm. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in the number. Oh, when the saints go marching. When you realize that you made it. Boy, you ever see somebody go crazy because they won $20 in a scratch card? I know you play. I know you play. I ain't judging you. I ain't judging you. You go crazy for $20. How about paradise? How about eternal glory? We don't preach about it enough. But guys, there is a heaven that Jesus went to prepare for us. And the thing that we value most down here, gold, that's what they used to pave the streets with. The streets are paved with gold. We're going to go crazy. And, and so, so, so I'd like for us to start to go a little bit crazy even before that happens. I'd like for us to just start worshiping because if we are on the side that humbles willingly, that bows willingly, why don't we just start bowing now? Bow down to God. Give up your way of life that is sinful. Abandon it. Amen. Walk right before him. Let him be your everything. Don't pretend. Don't come here to pretend. You could be sinning. If you're going to go to hell, you might as well enjoy the way. Some of us want to go to heaven. Some of us love Jesus. Some of us want to change our lives. Some of us believe that there's still power in the gospel. Some of us want to be the the agents of change. We want to be the ones preaching the gospel. We want to help other people find this love that we have in Jesus Christ. Men, if that's you, please stand to your feet. Let's worship God today. We're going to sing a song today, and I just want you to accept this thing that you are. I I want you to do, listen, while you stand, three things that I want you to look at. You say, Bishop, how do I do this? How do I get to where you're talking about? Number one, believe. Somebody say believe. Believe. Number two, submit. Somebody say submit. Submit. And number three, rejoice. Somebody say rejoice. Rejoice. Amen. That's all you got to do today. Number one, believe. You cannot say, nobody ever told me about this. Not after today. You heard me say it. Now you're responsible for what you've heard. So might as well believe. You might as well accept. You might as well accept Jesus into your heart. Love him as your Lord and your Savior. Listen, we talk about entitlement. Entitled people want Jesus to be their Savior, but they don't want him to be their Lord. We don't don't want him to tell us what to do. We don't want him to tell us that we have to stop living a, a certain lifestyle. No, we want to keep living the way we want 
but still get the reward of being saved. It doesn't work that way, honey. I'm sorry. It's not the way it is. There's going to be some sacrifice. Believe. Number two is submit. If you hope to be among the people that bow the knee willingly, you need to submit now. Submit today. Submit to God. Submit to his way in your life. Turn to him in faith and repentance. And identify yourself with people who worship God. Don't say those people. Stop, stop referring to me and my people as those people. Start to count yourself as one of us. We. I am one in the number. Amen. And lastly, when you've done those two things, you can rejoice. Believe that God says to you today, let's give ourselves all to Christ. So let's worship him. Gladly worship him and lift up our songs. Come on, let's sing it to the Lord. Amen, somebody. Let's sing to the Lord, yes? Let's praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God.